Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different components of what you require to perform the recombinant DNA technology. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, general overview of the recombinant DNA technology, we have discussed about what are different processes you have to perform to uh, generate the uh, cloned gene uh, or what are the things you require to you know clone the gene from a genome. Then you also discuss about the restriction digestions, we discuss about the uh, ligations and all that right and then we also said that once the, the recombinant construct is ready then you are supposed to transform that into the bacterial species and so on and, uh, and all these are the general overview of the recombinant DNA technology. Now if you recall uh, in the current uh, chapter we are discussing about the two components of the recombinant DNA technology. One is the host cells, the other is the transforming agents. In the previous two lectures we discuss about the, uh, the host cells, so we have discussed about the prokaryotic host cells and we have also discussed about the eukaryotic host cells. Within the prokaryotic host, uh, uh, host cells we have discussed about the E. coli and the bacillus subtilis. Whereas, within the eukaryotic host cells, we have discussed about the yeast animals and we have also discussed about the insect cell lines. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to start discussing about the transforming agents and uh, the relevance of the transforming agents and as we said in the uh, beginning itself that you require the two components, you require the host cells and you also require the, the cognate pair of the transforming agents. For example, if I want to work with the bacteria as a host cells, I require the transforming agent which is suitable for the bacterial expression system. So that is why uh, this two component system and or the understanding of, our, of the two component system is very very important for uh, successfully uh, understanding and performing the recombinant DNA technology. Discuss about the host cells in the, uh, in the previous uh, lec two lectures right. We have discussed about the prokaryotic host cells and we have also discussed about the eukaryotic host cells and then the second component. So, this is the first component what we have already discussed. Now, the second component is the transforming agents or the, uh, the plasmids. Now, the transforming agents are commonly being called as vectors because so for the first question comes what is vector and what is the function of a vector in the recombinant DNA technology. So, vector uh, is a carrying agent or carrier agent actually. So, vector a vector DNA is a vehicle that is used to transfer the genetic material into a target cell that is the host cell. So, it is actually a carrier which actually going to carry the recombinant DNA into the host cell and that is how it is going to allow the expression and as well as the proliferation of that recombinant DNA into the host cells. This transfer is usually done for the purpose of cloning, gene expression or the genetic engineering. Vectors are carrier for introducing the foreign DNA into the host cells where it can replicate and be expressed. So, depending upon the different types of vectors you can actually be able to either uh, uh, you know uh, either replicate the particular thing so that it can actually form the large quantity of the RNA species or you can actually be able to uh, allow the expression constructs so that it can actually be able to express the proteins out of these recombinant DNA. Now when you want when you think about the vector right which actually can perform these functions which means it can actually carry the uh, foreign DNA right and it can also allow the replication of the foreign DNA right. If I, if I need a vector with these two capabilities and then also should get into the host cells right. So, it should also get into the host cells. Um, I need the vector with a certain 
minimum properties certain properties of the vector is required right so what are these properties and what are these uh, uh, component which you require to prepare a vector so the components of a vector right so uh, for example i have taken an example of pbr322 which is also given in your textbook a vector should contain the following elements to be used for the gene cloning number 1 it should have the origin of replications number 2 it should have the selectable markers so number 1 see origin of replications so these are the specific sequences present in the plasmid and that are responsible for their initiation of replication within the host cells and origin of replication is related to the host cells right it is not related to the uh to the uh, vector actually so if you want the uh, origin of rap if you put the origin of replication of the prokaryotic origin then it is actually going to replicate into the prokaryotic system if you put the origin of replication of the uh, eukaryotic system it will actually going to replicate into the eukaryotic system and if you put that for the mammalian expression system then it is actually going to do into the mammalian cells then we also require the selectable marker right because at the end when you are going to generate the recombinant dna where you are going to have the uh, unligated product and the ligated product you also require a selection marker right so that you can be able to select the recombinant dna from the non recombinant dna so selectable marker these are required to selectively screen out the transformants right examples of such markers are gene that confer a selective advantages for the survival of the host cells containing the vector under the stress condition an examples of such gene is the ampicillin resistant gene for example in the case of pbr322 what you see here is it has the two selectable marker one is the ampicillin resistant gene another one is the tetracycline resistant gene so both of these ampicillin or the tetracycline antibiotic resistant genes will allow the growth of the pbr32 inside the host cells or the bacteria uh, in the presence of the these antibiotics whereas the normal bacteria is which does not contain or which does not will have the this particular construct is actually going to die Now the third component is required the cloning sites because you also want to insert your uh, uh, foreign dna into uh, the vector right or into the so you require a cloning site or the multiple cloning site the mcs contain the multiple unique restriction enzyme recognition site that can be digested and a foreign dna fragment can be inserted into the digested plasmids so for example in this particular case you have this is the origin of replications and this is the uh, so and then you are also going to have the for example the selectable genetic markers such as the ampicillin resistance gene and then you also going to have the uh, promoters and other kinds of things right so then you also require the cloning site so you are going to have the multiple cloning site but what is the purpose of the multiple cloning site is that it is actually going to have the different types of restriction enzyme so what you can do is you can take the your gene right and if you digest the gene with for example restriction enzyme 1 right and if you take the vector also uh, which actually contains this particular restriction enzyme so then if you cut this way it is actually going to have a, uh, a vector which contains the cohesive site on both the end right so it is going to have the cohesive sites on both the end and with the help of this particular fragment it can actually be able to ligate and it is actually going to give you the circularized product so only this vector this insert will insert into this with the help of this restriction enzyme and that is the purpose of keeping a cloning site into the vector then uh, depending upon whether you want the cloning vector or whether you want the expression vector you are also going to have the expression elements such as the promoter and the regulatory section so another essential component of the vector is the promoter and the other regulatory elements that regulate the copy number as well as the translational capacity of the vector for example here you have the uh this is a bacterial expression system so you can are going to have the bacterial promoters and then you also require the promoter sequences so promoter will allow the binding of the rna polymerase and that's how it is actually going to uh 
uh, you know initiate the transcription and then from here you are actually going to get the transcripts and then you also require the ribosome binding sites and so on. And uh, here for example, you are actually this is the multiple cloning site. So, here you are actually going to insert your foreign DNA. So, what will happen is that the promoter the RNA polymerase will bind here and then it will start transcribing the uh, this particular uh, vector right. And when it will transcribe it is actually going to transcribe your construct also. And at, at the end you are going to get the RNA of the particular gene right and then once you have the RNA it will actually going to be received by the ribosome and that is how it is actually going to start synthesizing the proteins. So, if you want to express a particular protein then you actually require the promoter and as well as the other accessory regulatory sequences such as the operator sequences, ribosome binding sites, I am sure you have heard about the Schindergano sequences and other kinds of things. When you will discuss, when you will study about the transcription and translation, you will know more about these uh, sequences which are actually going to control the transcription and the translation of a particular uh, gene uh, fragments. So, now you require the four step right, you require first you require the uh, the replication uh, origin of replication right. So, you require the uh, origin of replication, you require the selection marker you require sorry you require the cloning site right and you require the promoter and the regulatory sequences. So, if I want to design the vector right I have to keep all these uh, components under the considerations. Now, beside these uh, components you also have to consider many other parameters when you are designing a vector. What are these? So, number one is the size of the vector. So, the size of the vector should be appropriate based on the length of the insert that will be used. The size of the vector insert is also an essential consideration to increase the transformation efficiency. So, you know that the, when I am talking about the size, I am talking about the DNA size or DNA length actually. Okay. And if you are actually designing a vector, the DNA length has to be minimum so that uh, so, that the transformation efficiency should be maximum ok, because transformation efficiency is uh, inversely proportional to the length of the DNA, because the bigger the length you are going to take it is going to be get transformed with a lower efficiency, because you know that if you are having a heavy uh, particles it is not difficult or it is, it is difficult to those heavy particle to insert inside the cell compared to that if you have a lighter particles right. So, that is why it is desirable that you should design a vector which is of the smaller in size. So, that so you should reduce all those four components what we have discussed. So, you just you reduce the original replication. So, you reduce the size of the multiple cloning site, you reduce the size of the uh, you know the selectable markers and you also reduce the size of the promoter and other kinds of component in such a way that you should reduce the overall size of a vector, because that is what you require or what that is what the desirable uh, thing when you are designing a new vectors. Then it is should be compatible, so it should be compatible with the host cells which means it should have all the uh, desirable components like origin of replications and other kind of things, promoter also should be as per the ho host cells and so on. So, the vector must be compatible with the host organism and its genetic machinery. It is necessary as different regulatory element of the different host organism need to be considered when designing a vector. An example of such a regulatory element is the origin of replication which is different for the different host. So, that is one example that your origin of replication of a prokaryotic origin is going to be only allow the uh, replication of this particular DNA fragment only into the prokaryotic system. Similarly, you can have the origin of replication of yeast, you can have the origin of applications of the mammalian system and so on. So, origin of replication is going to decide in what are the host components or host cells this particular vector can be replicated. And then the th third is the selection markers right. 
So, selection is very important. So, as uh, selection markers are as ancient component of the vector, this allows the specific selection of the transformants. Then the fourth component is cloning, right. So, because the major uh, application of the uh, uh, major component uh, application of the vector is the utilizing that into the cloning applications, right. So, specific vectors are required the design to replicate and amplify within the host cells. Such vectors are said to be have a high copy number and are useful when we need the multiple copies of the same vector. Then we also require it is for uh, then we also require the vectors for the gene expression studies. So, specific vectors containing foreign gene can be inserted into the host cell for the expression. This is important for studying the gene function and producing the recombinant proteins. Then you also require the vectors for the molecular biology research. So, vectors are essential for studying the gene structure regulation and function. So, basically with the help of the vector you can be able to study the transcription, you can be able to study the translation right and you can also be able to study the replication. So, you can actually be able to study all the three major uh, component of the central dogma of molecular biology. So, you can actually be able to study the replications, you can actually be able to study the transcriptions and you can also be able to study the translation and that is the very very major applications of the vectors. Then vector can be used even in the gene therapy applications. You know that the gene therapy where you are actually going to supply the proteins right, you are actually going to supply the proteins. Uh, which is defective right or which is not present right that is the basic of basis of the gene therapy. Now, this uh, protein supply can be done either by producing the protein outside right or you can actually be able to clone this protein into a vector right and then insert the vector into the host and then the what will happen is once it uh, the vector will get into the human body it will start producing the protein. So, this approach for this approach you actually require the vector for the gene therapy applications. So, recent development of viral vector has made the delivery of the therapeutic genes into the target cell to treat the genetic disorder and disease possibility. This is a massive leap in the field, uh, field of the gene therapy. With the advancement in the field of molecular tools such as CRISPR Cas9 which is a genome editing tools. A specific editing of genomic ed genomic editing within the disease individual has become a reality. Now, uh, we have discussed so far about what is vector, what are the components of a vector and what is the applications of the vector. Uh, if you talk about the different types of vectors, so what are the different types of vector present? So, di different vectors could be of different types right. It could be because as we, as we, as we discussed some of these applications for doing any application you require the different types of vectors. So, let us see what are the different types of vectors which you require for the different types of applications. So, uh, types of vectors, several types of vectors are used according to their need and applications they have been listed below right. So, number one you are actually going to use the plasmids. So, plasmids are a generalized term for the vector which we are going to use within the bacterial system. So, these are small circular DNA molecule replicated independently of the host chromosome. Plasmids are commonly used for expression and uh, cloning and expression vectors in the bacterial and the other organism. They can deliver insert of size up to 10 kb. So, 10 kb is the DNA length actually. So, I am sure you may be aware of the uh, that we are measuring the size of a DNA or the length of a DNA in terms of the 10 uh, into in terms of the uh, kilo base pair or the base pair length actually. So, this is called as kilo base pair length actually because you know that the two base pairs what what is the length they are actually going to take. So, it is actually a, a uh, length of the DNA what is being re replicated. Then you also require the bacteriophage. So, bacteriophage bacteriophage are certain type of viruses that can infect the bacteria 
these viruses can be genetically manipulated to carry the foreign DNA and deliver it into the bacterial cell. They can be delivered insert of size up to 8 to 25 kb. So, see the plasmids carrying uh, insert carrying capacity is only 10 kb. Bacteriophage which is, is much smaller than the plasmid is having the higher uh, uh, carrying capacity that is the 8 to 25 kb and that is what I was trying to explain you when I was trying to explain you the consideration of the different parameters and one of the consideration was the size. So, as you reduce the size of a vector, you will increase the size of the insert and consequently you will be able to express or you can be able to study the bigger DNA fragments. Then number 3, uh, you are going to have the viral vectors. So, viral vectors, viruses can be engineered to carry the foreign genes and deliver them to the target cells. Viral vectors are extensively used in gene therapy to transfect the eukaryotic host. This anyway we are going to discuss in detail when we are going to discuss about the application of recombinant DNA technology in subsequent lecture. So, we are going not going to uh, discuss in this uh, here in detail. Then we also require the cosmids. So, cosmids these are the hybrid vector containing the element of both plasmid and as well as the bacteriophage. They can deliver the larger insert of 23 to 40 kb sizes to the target cells. Then you also require the artificial chromosome such as the yeast artificial chromosome or yak. So, these are the vector designated specifically for the cloning of large insert. Three types of artificial chromosome has been designed until now the yeast artificial chromosome which is in the size of 200 to 500 kb uh, inserts, phage artificial chromosome which can take the insert up to 300 kb base pair and the bacterial artificial chromosome which can take up the insert from in the range of 100 to 300 kb base pair. So, yeast artificial chromosomes are uh, having the applications where you are going to put the large inserts right. So, they are very good in terms of preparing the genomic library right. So, they are good in terms of genomic library because that allow to uh, study these inserts right. So, since the genomes of the certain organisms such as humans are very big. So, you can actually chop off these inserts in the genomic DNA into the smaller fragments and then you insert individual fragments into the yeast artificial or uh, used yeast or the bacterial artificial chromosomes and that is how you can be able to study the individual component and that is how you can be able to uh, study the whole organisms or whole genome actually. So, let us discuss uh, and apart, so apart from these, apart from these you can also have the other kinds of vectors which is be based on the applications. So, you can have the cloning vectors and you can also have the expression vectors. So, cloning vectors are the DNA molecule that replicate and propagate the foreign DNA into the host cells. In other words, it will produce the clones of themselves within the host cells are known as cloning vectors. They are essentially, they are essential molecular biology and genetic engineering tools for cloning the genes, constructing the genomic library and producing the recombinant proteins. The most common cloning vectors are the plasmids. They are small circular DNA molecule that replicate independently of the host chromosomes. So, this is the one of the uh, cloning vector which is called as PUC19 and we are going to discuss many of these uh, vectors when we will talk about the bacterial where vectors will what talk will when we will discuss about the eukaryotic vectors and so on. And then you also have the multiple cloning site, you have the ampicillin resistance gene, you have the origin of replication and so on. And this is a table which uh, says what will be the carrying capacity of the different types of vectors. You can have the plasmid which can carry uh, around 10 kb. Then you have the bacteriophage based vector which can actually carry from 8 to 25 kb. Then you have the cosmids which are much smaller than the plasmid and the phasmid and cosmid is a hybrid of the plasmid and uh, bacteriophage which can carry from 23 to 40 kba. Then you require the pack which is actually uh, can carry from 100 to 300 kb. Then you, you require the back which is called as bacterial expression system and which can carry even more than 300 kb uh, DNA. And then we have the yak which is called as yeast artificial chromosome. So, it is called as yeast artificial chromosome. Yeah. 
and that is the 200 to 500 kb so basically yeast yak actually can carry the maximum frag maximum size of the fragment as per this particular list so uh, Cloning vectors have a several application in molecular biology as well as genetic engineering like the cloning and propagation of a DNA fragment right. So, you can actually be able to study the replication of a particular fragment, you can actually be able to study uh, replication of the gene fragment, you can actually be able to study with which sequence of this particular gene is difficult to replicate or which sequence is difficult to or easy to replicate, which fragment is doing such and that. Then you can actually be able to use the cloning vector for the construction of genomic library for the genome sequences and gene delivery. Then you can also be able to use the cloning vector for creating the transgenic organism by introducing the foreign DNA into the model organism for the functional studies. This also we are going to discuss in detail when we are going to talk about the transgenic organisms. So, we will be going to discuss about the transgenic plants, we are going to discuss about the transgenic animals. So, when we talk about the appli applications of the recombinant DNA technology that time we are you will understand more about the usage and as well as the relevance of the cloning vector in generating the transgenic animals. Then the second category is the expression vector. So, exp there is a small difference between the cloning vector and the expression vector. Cloning vectors will not have the promoters and the protein uh, production machinery uh, components right. Whereas, expression vector will have the all other components what is present in the cloning vector plus they are also going to have the promoters and the accessory elements. So, the expression vectors are the DNA molecule designed to efficiently express the foreign gene into the host cells. This allow the production of protein encoded by those genes. These vectors contain the regulatory elements necessary for the transcription and translation of the inserted gene facilitating the systematic and uh, controlled expression of the encoded proteins. Expression vector contains a foreign uh, promoter regions, a DNA sequence that initiates the transcription of the inserted gene. This allows the robust transcription of the foreign gene under the various conditions. Promoters can be constitutive right, so they can be always on right or inducible which is can be activated under the specific conditions. The inducible promoters allow the temporal control over the expression of the clone genes. Promoter used in the expression vector uh, include the LAC promoters, T7 promoters, CMB promoter and the SV promoter and all these are actually the inducible promoters right. So, you can actually be able to use some of these promoters for driving the expression of the host cells. A terminator sequence is also present at the 3 prime end of the inserted gene to signal the end of the transcription. Termination sequence helps to prevent the read through transcription beyond the gene of interest ensuring the proper processing of the messenger RNA transcripts. So, that is a part of the transcription and translation right. Then the cloned gene is inserted between the promoter at the 5 prime end and a terminated sequence at the 3 prime end. This portion of the vector is known as the expression cassette. Such vectors are therefore sometimes called as a sandwich expression vectors. The multiple cloning site is a region within the expression vector that contains the multiple unique dictation enzyme recognition sequence. This allows these sites allow for the insertion of the gene of the interest in frame with the promoter and other regulatory element, ensuring the proper transcription and translation. So, this term the in framing and all that you will not have to worry about this because this you will going to understand when we are going to discuss about the transcription and translation right. So, when you will discuss about the replication transcription translation that time you will understand what is in framing. In framing means that it the the uh, the uh, the starting or initiating codon. Uh, would, will be in frame with the your gene the proteins uh, uh, AUG ok, because if they are not in the same frame which means you know that the genetic codes are having the 3 letter codes right. So, these 3 letter code will go by 3 letter code right. So, if you are going to have the promoter and promoters plus 1 site is actually going to have a first uh, 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 like uh, initiator codon right 
your gene should also have the AUG in the same frame which means if you make the 3333 copies uh, or the 33 groups it should actually match the same same way right so it should also um, uh, match with the same right so it is like like a, a, a like this so this should be the sequence so if you count from here a the AUG of your protein and the AUG what is present just after the promoter should be in synchronous right which will be having the uh, multiples of 3 and that is what called as in framing and if it is not then the protein will not be going to be expressed from utilizing this particular AUG. The expression vector typically contain a selection marker such as antibiotic resistance gene that allow for the selectable identification of the transformants. The ribosome binding site is a sequence that facilitate the proper binding of the ribosome to the messenger RNA to initiate the protein slicization. This sequence is also known as the Shine-Dargano sequence in bacteria or the COSAC sequences in the eukaryotes. The RBS is the upstream of the inserted gene start codon that is the AUG. A strong ribosome binding site is incorporated in the expression factor for streamlined protein circulation. So, this is what I was talking about some time back that if you require the robust expression of a protein you should also put the, uh, the strong accessory sequences such as ribosome binding sites and Shine-Dargano sequences or COSAC sequences. So, that when you are going to do the transcriptions you are also going to generate the fragment which is actually going to have the very strong uh, you know tendency to bind the ribosomes and initiate the translation. So, this is actually going to decide uh, what will be the final production of the protein from the this particular vector. In uh, eukaryotic expression vector a polyadenylation sequence is also included downstream of the coding sequence just before the termination sequence. The poly A signal promotes the addition of a poly A tail to the messenger RNA transcript stabilizing it and enhancing the translational efficiency. So, in the eukaryotic expression system you will add the eukaryotic features such as you are actually going to add the polyadenylation site so that polyadenylation tail can be added into the uh, in, into the in, into the final transcripts right and as a result you are actually going to enhance the life of that particular messenger RNA into the host cells. Now, apart from the cloning and expression vector we also have the other different kinds of vectors such as shuttle vectors. So, shuttle vectors. So, shuttle vectors are the specialized vector that can replicate and be maintained in the multiple host organism which might be of different species or cell type. They are versatile tool for cloning, gene expression and genetic manipulation across different biological system. So, shuttle vectors are the vectors which can actually replicate between the two host right. So, host 1 and host 2. So, it can actually replicate in both which means it are actually going to have the origin of replication of both the our, uh, host. Majority of the cloning vectors which you are going to use for the mammalian expression system are actually belonging to this category because they are actually going to be rep, uh, propagated within the bacterial expression system until the construct is not ready. So, once the construct is ready then they are going to be transfected into the mammalian expression system. So, this is very very they are very very uh, you know important tool because if you have the ability to work with the bacterial expression system for the initial uh, 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 parts right. So, that you can actually be able to do cloning and other kind of things then once the cloning is done then you can actually do the protein production and other things in the host too and that is why they are actually giving the lot of flexibility in performing the different types of uh, component different types of task. This versatility allows the researcher to manipulate the DNA in one host and then transfer the vector to another host for the further experimentation. I have already given you an example like for example, you will do the manipulation in E. coli and then you will do the expression studies in the mammalian expression system or you can use the uh, E. coli uh, sorry uh, yeast expression system and yeast insect cell line expression system. So, since the uh, manipulation and the uh, initial uh, steps are easy to perform in E. coli it is you can be able to use that as a host. Common combination of the host organism for shuttle vector includes like bacteria in yeast, 
bacteria and mammalian cells yeast and mammalian cells and the bacteria and the plant cells similar to the previous vector type shuttle vector also contain the selectable marker that confer a selective advantage to the host cell containing the vector these markers enable the identification and association of cells carrying the shuttle vector selection markers can include the antibiotic resistant genes or genes that complement the specific nutritional deficiency into the host organism now shuttle vectors are also going to carry the rep origin of replications compatible with the replication machinery of both the host organism for which they are designed for example a shuttle vector designed for the bacteria and yeast contains both the bacteria and the yeast uh, replication origins allowing it to replicate and be maintained in both types of cells it is important to note that in each host organism only one of the origins are activated right so this is we have already discussed that if you require the two origin of replications one for host host one the other one is for the host two and then only you can be able to replicate within the two uh, host organisms shuttle vectors are often include the promoter and regulatory element specific to the expression vector of each host organism these element ensure the efficient transcription and translation of the inserted gene in each host optimizing the gene expression across the different biological context uh, similar to standard cloning vectors shuttle vectors have a multiple cloning site that allow the insertion of the foreign dna fragment the multiple cloning site contains the multiple unique restriction enzyme recognition sequence facilitating the cloning of the gene or regulatory element for the expression in the multiple host shuttle vectors are valuable tools for various applications in molecular biology and biotechnology they enables the researcher to perform the genetic manipulations such as cloning expression and mutagenesis in one host organism where are transferring the vector to another host for functional studies or the production so this is one of the shuttle vectors right uh, where you have the Uh, multiple cloning site you have the eukaryotic application you can have the bacterial origin of replications you can have the selectable markers like for bacteria you can have the selectable marker for the eukaryotic cells you can have the eukaryotic promoter this means this is actually going to promote or produce the protein into the eukaryotic system and then you also have the eukaryotic termination sequence so poly a signal so that it actually going to add the poly a tail into the rna after the transcription is done Uh, the common application of the shuttle vector includes the constructing hybrid proteins analyzing the gene functions in the different biological system and producing the recombinant protein for the therapeutic or the industrial use so so far what we have discussed we have discussed about the cloning vectors we have discussed about the expression vector we have discussed about the shuttle vector so these are the generalized uh, discussion about the different types of vectors okay now let's move on to the uh, discussing about the uh, vectors what are present in the different host system or the vector what is required for the different host system so the different host specific vector what we are going to discuss in this particular chapter or in this particular lecture is the bacterial plasmids we are going to discuss about the phage based vectors you are going to discuss about the yeast vector and we are also going to discuss about the mammalian vectors so bacterial discuss or bacterial plasmids bacterial plasmids plasmids are widely widely been used for cloning the foreign dna into the bacteria as a host organism different forms of plasmids so different uh, bacterial plasmid is a double standard circular dna exist in three different forms if both the strands of circular dna are intact then it is called as covalently circular dna or triple c form whereas if one of the strand has nick then it is called as the conformation of open circle dna or the oc dna during the isolation of the plasmid dna from the bacteria covalently circular dna loses few number of turn and as a result it requires a super coiled dna this means the bacterial plasmids are going to be present in three different types of conformation it can be uh, closely uh, covalently closed circular dna it could be open circular dna and it could be super coiled dna okay and all these three forms are coexisting together when you are going to isolate the plasmid from the host cells 
Now let us take uh, how you going to construct the uh, plasmids. So, this is the first plasmid what is being constructed under the artificial system. Plasmids are naturally being present into the bacterial, bacterial system because they are actually being uh, extra chromosomal DNA, they are actually being utilized for transferring the, uh, the important uh, phenotypic features between the, colony, between the colony of a bacteria. So, for example, if you have one bacteria has a certain plasmid and another bacteria has certain plasmid, they will exchange their plasmids in such a way so that both of these species will have the advantage, right. So, this will this bacteria for example, if this is the bacteria number 1, if this is the bacteria number 2, uh, so they will exchange their extra chromosomal DNA. They cannot exchange the genetic material right, uh, without having the sexual reproduction, but they can actually be able to exchange their extra chromosomal DNA and as a result they this guy is also going to confer the additional features, this guy is also going to confer the additional feature. But this we are talking about the natural plasmids which were present, but natural plasmid does not contain many of the features what we have just discussed. For example, it will not have the multiple cloning site, it may not have the uh, antibiotic resistance gene and it may not have other kinds of component, other kinds of uh, important features like the uh, promoters and all those things. So, what humans have done or what the scientists have done, uh, they have actually de derived the, the DNA fragments from the multiple uh, naturally occurring plasmids and that is how they have constructed the first um, vector and that is the PBR32. So, what they have done is they have derived the sum of the bacteria DNA from the naturally occurring plasmid or naturally occurring vector that is called PSC101. So, this is the region what they have derived from the PSC101, right? this is the region what they have derived from the PSC101. Then this is the region what they have derived from the another bacterial species that is called as PMB1 derived material that is actually going to have the origin of replications. This region is going to give you the tetracyclic resistance gene and then the third region which is this region actually is actually being derived from the RSF2124 and as and that is actually going to give you the ampicillin resistance gene. So, this RS2124 is giving the ampicillin resistance gene, PSC101 is giving the tetracyclin resistance genes and the PMB1 is giving the origin of replication and that is how the one artificial human or man made vector is being generated and that is called as PBR322. Let us see what are the features of the PBR322. So, PBR322 is a 4359 base pair long plasmid and has 40 unique restriction sites. 11 restriction sites are present within the tetracycline resistance gene and 6 sites are present within the ampicillin resistance gene. So, this is the uh, complete uh, vector map of the PBR322 where you are actually going to have the 40 unique restriction sites. So, you have the restriction sites which are present within the tetracycline resistance genes, you have the restriction site which are present within the ampicillin um, resistance genes and you are also going to have the, uh, the restriction sites which are with throughout this particular uh, throughout with particular vector. Uh, in addition, the two sites are present within the promoter of the tetracycline resistance gene. Cloning any DNA fragment into these sites will disrupt the resistance gene and as a result it can be used as a criteria for selecting the recombinant plasmid. This means, if you clone into any of these ampicillin or tetracycline uh, resistance genes, right, you are actually going to make the vector insensitive to these antibiotics and that is how that can be used as a criteria to screen. And that screening and other kinds of things we are going to discuss when we are going to discuss about the these aspects into our subsequent uh, lectures. What is the application of PBR322? It is the most popular plasmid for the cloning purpose. It is used for studying the transcription and translation of the prokaryotic gene and it is a primary force of the design and construct the improved plasmid for the specific applications. I am giving you the, the, uh, the uh, reference of the construction of the PBR322. So, if you are more interested, you can be able to go through with this particular uh, research article where the scientists have 
um, described in detail how they have constructed the PBR 22 as a vector. Then from PBR 22 we have derived many more vectors such as uh, PUC 19. So, PUC 19 is a cloning vector, this is a vector map of a PUC 19 and PUC 19 is a bacterial plasmid of a smaller size, it is a 2.8 kb, remember that the PBR 22 was 4.5 kb containing the multiple cloning site, the usual place to keep the MCS is always between the initiation codon and the codon 7 and MCS allow the design of many cloning strategies as per large number of enzyme available for the cloning. So, this is the uh, LAXZ, this is the LAXZ gene which is required for the blue red screening and then you also have the MCS which is going to be used for cloning purpose. In addition, the two enzyme from the MCS can be used to insert the foreign DNA without disturbing the plasmid sequences. PUC 19 vector also has a small stretch of DNA which encode for the rapid detection of the insert by the blue white skin and that is this laxy gene. Now, let us see how you can be able to isolate the plasmids from the uh, from the bacterial cell. So, the first step would be that you have tra you have a transformed uh, bacteria right these are the transformed bacteria. So, what you are going to do is you inoculate the transformed bacteria into a suitable bacterial media right. So, the step 1 would be that the bacterial containing plasmid was grown in a suitable culture in high density that is the 0.8 uh, optical density. Each bacterial cell contain the chromosomal DNA, plasmid DNA and cellular protein. The bacterial cell culture is collected by the centrifugation at the bottom and resuspended into the solution 1 which contains the 50 millimolar glucose, 25 millimolar tris and 10 millimolar ADTA. So, you are going to collect the bacterial cell, you are going to resuspend that into the solution 1. Then you go to the step 2, in the step 2 you are going to do the alkaline lysis. So, alkaline lysis the bacteria cells are treated with the lysis solution which contains the 0.2 normal NaOH and 10 percent SDS to lyse the cells and denature the DNA. Then step 3 you are going to do the renaturation. So, you, this will actually going to renature, uh, denature the uh, plasmid and it is also going to denature the chromosomal DNA. Now, uh, it is you were in the next step you are going to renature in such a way that the plasmid is going to be renatured. So, once it get renatured it is going to be present into the solution whereas, the chromosomal DNA is still not going to be denatured. So, in the third step the denatured DNA is renatured with the solution 3 containing the potassium acetate, glacial steak acid. In this step, small DNA renatures back quickly whereas, the chromosomal DNA remain denatured which means after the third step, you are going to get the pellet and you are also going to get the supernatant. That supernatant is going to contain the plasmid right and that is what it is shown here right. Once you do the renaturation, you are going to get a plasmid, the uh, pellet, right, and you are also going to get the supernatant. The supernatant is going to contain the plasmid DNA and as well as the protein, whereas the pellet is going to contain the chromosomal DNA because chromosomal DNA is big, so it will get, it is going to precipitate. Then you are going to do the chloroform phenol extraction, and as a result of chloroform phenol extraction, the protein is going to be get precipitated whereas, the plasmid will still be present in the solution and once this has been done, you can actually be able to collect this into the another tube and then you do the alcohol precipitation and that is actually going to give you the uh, plasmid pellet. So, that is what it is written here. In the step 4, you are going to do the deproteinations and in the step 5, once you are going to have the pure uh, plasmids, you are actually going to precipitate that with the help of the 100 percent alcohol. So, uh, this is all about the plasmid isolations and since this is a very, very interesting uh, aspects and it is very easy to perform, uh, I thought why not we should take you to my lab where we can actually be able to show you how to perform the plasmid isolations utilizing this method and it will actually going to give you a better understanding about the whole process. Plasmid is an extra chromosomal DNA molecule which can replicate independently. They are most commonly found as small circular double stranded DNA molecules in bacteria. 
plasmids carry genes that benefit the survival of the organism and confer selective advantage such as antibiotic resistance today we will be isolating plasmids from e coli dh5 alpha cells for this experiment we need e coli dh5 alpha cells solution 1 solution 2 solution 3 chloroform isopropanol 70% ethanol sterile micro centrifuge tubes sterile tips and pipettes we have taken overnight grown dh5 alpha cells at first we will pellet down the cells by centrifuging at 11000 rpm for 30 seconds now to the pellet we will add 200 microliter of solution 1 and then we will resuspend the pellet and then it will be incubated for 5 minutes after the incubation 200 microliter of solution 2 will be added and then it will be kept in ice for 10 minutes after incubation in ice now 350 microliter of solution 3 will be added to the mixture then it will be mixed gently by inverting the tubes now it will be centrifuged at 11000 rpm for 5 minutes now we will transfer the supernatant in a fresh tube and we will discard the pellet after that in the supernatant we will add 200 microliter of chloroform and then we have to mix it vigorously then we will centrifuge it at 11000 rpm for 5 minutes now we will transfer the upper layer in a fresh tube then we are adding 500 microliter of ice cold isopropanol after that again centrifugation will be done at 11000 rpm for 5 minutes after centrifugation we will discard the supernatant now to the pellet we will add 500 microliter of 70% ethanol after that again centrifugation will be done at 11000 rpm for 5 minutes now we will discard the supernatant and 
we will keep it for drying until ethanol evaporates. After drying, we will dissolve the pellet in 20 microliter TE buffer. Once you isolate the uh, plasmids, uh, if you come to my lab right, and if you perform this, you are actually going to run it onto a agarose gel right you are going to run it on the agarose gel i'm sure you might have seen that how the students were loading the plasmid onto the agarose gel and how they were resolving once you are going to uh, isolate the plasmid and resolve it onto the agarose gel what you are going to see is you are going to see the three different forms of the plasmid you are going to see the clo covalently closed circular DNA, you are going to see the open circular DNA and you are going to see the supercoiled DNA and along with that you are also going to see a large quantity of RNA because we have not added the RNAs into your reactions. So, if you add the RNAs you will not find the RNA. So, this is the RNA what is present in the cell right which is also been present in along with the plasmids. If you want to re remove this, what you can do is you can treat the things with RNAs, right? RNAs is an enzyme which degrades the RNA and that is how you can be able to get rid of this. So, this is the plasmid what you are going to see which is present in the three forms, uh, covalently closed circle or OC forms and the supercoiled form. So, this is all about the uh, vectors in the bacterial expression system. Uh, what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the bacterial plasmids, we have discussed about the vectors, we have discussed about the different types of vectors, we have discussed about the cloning vectors, expression vectors, shuttle vectors and then we also discuss about the bacterial plasmids. And then at the end, we have also discussed about how you can be able to isolate these plasmids from the bacterial expression system or the bacterial cells. And uh, we have also taken you to my lab so that you can get a very uh, hands on experience also how to perform these experiments. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more aspects related to the vectors. Thank you.